The three armies of German Army Group B, seven panzer divisions and 13 infantry divisions, were poised to attack six American divisions. The American divisions were about to face an attack by greatly superior forces on a narrow front. They were ill-prepared to meet this force, nevertheless they did so. And we're going to highlight the stubborn fighting qualities of small groups of American soldiers who upset the timetable of the 5th Panzer Army. General Wagner, as Chief of Staff of the 5th Panzer Army, you were responsible for the planning of this offensive. What were these plans? The main objectives of the 5th Panzer Army were bridgeheads on the Maas River, and then to secure the flanks of the 6th Panzer Army with their objective Antwerpen. We had an order to the 47th Panzer Corps to take Bastogne if possible, but not to delay their push towards the Maas River. The timetable of the 5th Panzer Army was, on the first day, the three corps, two armoured and one infantry, would break through the American defences and seize crossings over the rivers Ur and Clerf. On the second day, reach the line saint vit ufalis bastogne and secure bridgeheads over the river Urth. On the third day, regroup and resupply and then continue the advance. On the fourth day, reach the Meuse. We're going to concentrate initially on the attack on the US 110th Regiment of the 28th Division by the two Panzer Divisions and one Volksgrenadier Division of the 47th Panzer Corps on the left of General von Manteuffel's 5th Panzer Army. The 47 Corps plan was for the 2nd Panzer Division to cross at Dasburg and for the 26th Volksgrenadier Division to cross at Gemunt, to be followed across by the Corps Reserve, the Panzer Lehr Division. As the two bridges at Gemunt and Dasburg had been blown, General von Manteuffel, the commander of 5th Panzer Army, had insisted that heavy bridging equipment should be made available so that his tanks could cross the Ur to support the infantry at the earliest possible moment. Colonel Hurley E. Fuller commanded the American sector designated for the 47th Panzer Corps breakthrough. It was held by the 1st and 3rd Battalions of the 110th Infantry Regiment. The remaining battalion had been detached as divisional reserve. As anything remotely resembling a continuous line across the nine to ten mile front was beyond the strength of his two battalions, he set up a system of village strong points, each man by a rifle company along the ridgeline highway. He had the support of two batteries of artillery and a small armoured reserve. This highway that was known to the Americans as Skyline Drive ran parallel to the Ur at a distance of between one and a half and two and a half miles. This then was the situation that faced the contestants on the night of the 15th, 16th December 1944. On the evening of the 15th of December, on the left of the 47th Panzer Corps front, the German screening troops of the 26th Volksgrenadier Division, which had been in the line for some time and would therefore not be identified by the Americans as a new formation, crossed to the West Bank. This they did every night, but this time, considerably reinforced, they moved forward to secure a bridgehead. At about 0300 hours, engineers manning rubber boats began ferrying the 80-man assault companies and heavy infantry weapons across the river. As each company disembarked, it moved up to the start line, which the screening force now held close to the American company positions. Fire! The first indication of the attack the American 110th Regiment got was when the shells started exploding around them. On the German right, the Panzer Grenadiers of the 2nd Panzer Division waited until the barrage began before crossing the Ur in their rubber boats. They toiled up from the river to attack Marnach on the main road to the Meuse. 
When they found that a frontal attack was of no use, they infiltrated around Marnak, both to the north and to the south, so putting themselves in a position to block any attempt to relieve the town. Two attempts were made, but in both cases, the Americans had to withdraw. At the same time that Marnach was under attack, a similar operation was being mounted against the town of Hosingen, three miles to the south. Here, at 05.30 hours, three hours before sunrise, a young soldier on duty, on top of the water tower, broke off during his periodic report by telephone to Company HQ, to say that the entire German line across the Ur had become pinpoints of light. Even as he was considering the possible meaning of this, the first shell started exploding in Hosingen, severing all wire communications. The Americans, by using the radios of the artillery observation post, were able to report to 110th Infantry Regiment headquarters at Clairvaux. Colonel Strickler, as executive officer of the 110th Regiment, located at Clairvaux, what do you remember of the morning of December the 16th? Well, we were awakened at about 5.45, around that time, uh, by the sound of uh, artillery shells falling in Clairvaux. I heard it, and I went over to the regimental commander, and I said, uh, looks like the Germans are having a little artillery practice. He says, yes, it's the first activity we've had for quite a long time. And uh, then the shelling increased, and uh, it looked as it was more than just an artillery practice, that there's something, possibly a preparation, fire for some kind of a local attack. And uh, so I said, well, the thing for us to do right away is to get uh, contact our frontline units, our battalion and companies, to see whether what they know about it, if any troubles up there. Meanwhile, at Hosingen, the defenders heard enemy infantry coming up a ravine and crossing the road just north of the town. This was an attempt to bypass the garrison. No actual movement could be seen until first light. And then the American light machine guns killed a number of Germans and held up the westward progress of the remainder. Another German column attacked from the south but in doing so, became involved in house-to-house -house fighting in the southern outskirts of Hosingen. This was something that they'd been expressly ordered to avoid. A perimeter defense was set up by the engineers, who dismounted the 50mm machine guns from their vehicles to be used as ground-based weapons. A request was sent back for more ammunition, but when five tanks from the divisional reserve arrived at about 1,600 hours, this request hadn't been passed to them, so there was no resupply of ammunition. Upon arrival, the tanks went into defensive positions with the infantry for the night. Three of the tanks moved to the high ground, southeast of the town, to help slow down the German advance. Within an hour, though, they were driven back by self-propelled guns, which the Germans were slowly managing to get across the river. The rear of Hosingen was now endangered by the continual penetration to the north and south so the town was defended on all sides, reinforced by the five Sherman tanks. At the same time that the initial assault was being made on Hosingen, the two nearby villages of Konstum and Hotham, some four miles from the river Ur and behind Skyline Drive, were also attacked. Half an hour after the barrage stopped, the forward outpost at Hotham spotted figures moving to their front. The American troops held their fire as they had no reason to think they were German. This doubt was quickly dispelled. However, repeated attacks by the Volksgrenadiers during the morning failed to capture the villages or bypass them. At one time, the Germans succeeded in capturing Konstum, but they were almost immediately driven out by a determined counterattack. 
Some time later, they managed to cut the road between Constum and Holtham. But once again, a quickly formed force of 20 cooks and men from Battalion HQ managed not only to open the road again, but also to inflict heavy casualties on the enemy. This stubborn American defence had cost the Volksgrenadiers the opportunity to become the first German troops to cross the cliff and lost them the time advantage that they'd gained by their night crossing of the Ur. It now became apparent that the inability of the German engineers to complete the bridges at Gemont and Dasburg on schedule was causing crucial delays in bringing the tanks of the second Panzer and Panzer Lear across the river Ur. These delays meant that the German infantry had to fight without armoured support for the first day of the offensive. This enabled the lightly held American positions to hold out against greatly superior numbers and had a decisive effect on the outcome of the first day's battle. The first German tanks and self-propelled guns were not able to cross the river until the late afternoon, and about dusk, the defenders of Marnak radioed that they could hear half-tracks moving towards the village. This was the last word heard from Marna. Now the road to the bridge at Clairvaux was clear. In Wiltz, the headquarters of the US 28th Division, the commander, General Cota, at the end of the first day's fighting, had to assess all the confused reports and requests that had been coming in all day and decide on the priorities. Despite frequent requests from Colonel Fuller, for the 2nd Battalion of the 110th Regiment, the only divisional reserve, to be allocated to him, General Cota had held on to it until he could accurately assess which of his three regiments was most in need of reinforcements. By 9pm, when most of the activity along his front seems to have died down, it was apparent that the 110th Infantry Regiment, in his centre, had borne most of the weight of the German attack. So he ordered one company of the reserve battalion to come to Wiltz to defend the divisional command post and released the remainder to Colonel Fuller. If this action had been taken earlier in the day, before the Germans got their armour across the Ur, the position at the end of the first day could have been very different. On the first day of the offensive, the staff of the 5th Panzer Army was contained. The surprise has succeeded and the advantage of the course was there sufficient. So we could give our reserve divisions to the course and our orders was not to be changed. However, General von Lutwitz, the commander of 47 Corps, was not entirely happy with the progress made in his sector. By midnight, Saturday the 16th of December, the end of the first day's fighting, 47 Corps had been held short of the River Clef, their first day's objective. The only American strong point that had fallen was Marnach, and the American troops in Hosingen were still in a position to stop the Panzer Lehr Division from racing across country towards their objective, the Meurs. His infantry had suffered heavy casualties in a number of comparatively minor actions. On the credit side, the heavy bridges were complete and he could move tanks and assault guns forward. Some tanks and self-propelled guns were already moving towards Clairvaux, and he had the night to move more forward, ready for the next day's attack. On the American side, the 28th Divisional Commander in Wiltz had decided to counter-attack on the following morning, and at Supreme Allied Headquarters, where confused situation reports were coming in, the decision was taken to move reinforcements into the area as a precaution. Two armoured divisions were diverted, the 7th was directed towards saint Vit to counter any attack from the north of the battle area, and the 10th was moved towards the key road centre of Bastoyne in the south. In the early hours of Sunday morning, the 17th of December, the Panzer Grenadiers of the 2nd Panzer Division had moved past Marnach along the main road leading west as far as the high ground overlooking Clairvaux. From here, they were able to cover the chateau with both automatic and rifle fire.
Because of the chateau's solid construction, this had very little effect, and the soldiers in it, mainly signalers and HQ personnel, were able to dominate the main bridge over the River Clough. The 110th Infantry Command Post, under Colonel Hurley Fuller, was located in the Clara Vallis Hotel at the northern end of the town. It was from here that he instructed the mixed group of administrative and service troops just to return the fire. He was more concerned with the plans for the counter-attack to retake Marnach. However, he was not aware that German armour was now on the scene in force. Tanks of 2nd Panzer Division were advancing on Clairvaux from two sides. The American counter-attack started an hour before first light on Sunday the 17th of December. An infantry attack was stopped by fire almost immediately. His tanks reached Marnach but fell back when they found the opposition to be too strong. The final American attack was disastrous. German self-propelled guns saw the squadron of honey tanks on the Skyline Drive and destroyed 11 out of 18 in the first 10 minutes. At Clairvaux, although the odds were increasing against the Mali, the American defenders continued to hit back. When the arrival of the German Mark IV tanks at the high ground was reported to Colonel Fuller, he immediately recalled his Sherman tanks, which had counter-attacked Marnach, to engage them. After crossing the main bridge at about 0900 hours, they then had to climb the steep winding road towards the waiting Mark IVs. The Americans were lucky, and for the loss of three tanks, they managed to knock out four Mark IVs. This attack evidently worried the German commander, for the pressure noticeably eased. After repeated requests for help to 8th Corps headquarters in Bastogne, a company of tanks from 9th Armoured Division's Combat Command R was sent to Clairvaux to Colonel Fuller's assistance. He immediately split this force into three to defend the Clairvaux bridges. Although not the most efficient way to utilize this small force of tanks, there seemed no alternative, as Colonel Fuller had received explicit orders from his divisional commander, General Cota, to hold his position at all costs. A final reinforcement was a battery of self-propelled anti-tank guns, and Colonel Fuller immediately sent them across the river by the bridge opposite his headquarters, to block any attempt by the Germans to enter Clairvaux from the north. An hour later, when the Panthers appeared, the Americans quickly withdrew, even losing one of their guns by overturning. This allowed the flow of German tanks and infantry into the town on both sides. Soon, tanks were firing at point-blank range into Colonel Fuller's headquarters in the Clara Vallis Hotel. When he reported to 28th Divisional Headquarters at Wiltz that both his 1st and 2nd Battalion command posts had been overrun, that he'd been cut off from his headquarters company, isolated in the chateau, and that he wanted to get as many of his staff out as possible, he was reminded that the order of General Middleton, the Corps Commander, to hold at all costs hadn't been altered. When a high explosive shell from a German tank exploded in a nearby room, Colonel Fuller hung up, got as many of his staff together as possible, and climbed out of a back window and scaled the nearby cliff. In the cellar of the hotel, where the switchboard was still functioning, the signal sergeant stayed at his post until there was no one left in the building other than the wounded. At 18.39 hours on the night of Sunday the 17th of December, he telephoned to the headquarters at Wiltz that the 110th Infantry Command Post had been evacuated, that German tanks and infantry were running wild in Clairvaux, 
and that he was the only able-bodied man left. This meant that a bridgehead had been secured over the river Clough, and later that night of the 17th of December, the 26 Volksgrenadiers seized a second bridge at Drowfelt, which for some reason had not been prepared for demolition. This was immediately crossed by the Panzer Lehr Reconnaissance Regiment, supported by a Panzer Grenadier Regiment. Throughout this second day, the defenders at Hosingen had hoped to be able to fight their way to join the defenders of Konstum, but because of the divisional order to hold at all costs, had to remain where they were. The promised reinforcements didn't arrive, so the area held slowly contracted in house-to-house -house fighting until they were contained in a tiny circle in the centre of the town. The observation post in the water tower remained in operation for most of the day in spite of being repeatedly shelled by high-velocity shells from tanks and anti-tank guns. The strong structure of the tower protected the troops who were able to continue to report on the German movements. Two of the American tanks were knocked out, but by the night of the 17th, Hosingen was still held by the Americans. The defence at Konstum had an equally important delaying action. Here, despite repeated attempts by the Volksgrenadiers to break through the positions, they were contained. And so, at the end of day two, Sunday, December the 17th, although the Germans had crossed the river Clerf in two places and were on the road to Bastogne, they were already over a day behind schedule. In Bastogne, the American Corps commander, General Middleton, moved the last of his armoured reserve into positions to defend the town, and Allied Supreme Headquarters, now aware of the magnitude of the attack, decided to commit its two reserve divisions. The 82nd Airborne was ordered to join the 7th Armoured near saint vit and 101st Airborne moved towards Bastogne. Combat Command B of the 10th Armoured Division was about to enter the town, while the remainder were moving towards positions to block any attack from the south. General Kinnard, as operations officer for the 101st Airborne Division, what orders were you given by Schaaf? Well, it was, it was a very uh, confusing kind of a situation, but uh, essentially the, the Schaaf plan had been to put uh, both airborne divisions in Bastogne. This was actually a, uh, a decision, as I remember, by General Whiteley, or a recommendation. And it was uh, based simply on the, uh, the quality of the road net through Bastogne, which the Germans called a road octopus. It was exactly that. And initially, uh, we were both to, uh, both divisions were to go up to uh, Bastogne, but there was a lot of confusion about whether the, we would both be under the 18th Airborne Corps, or split between the 8th and the 18th. Uh, this resulted in uh, advanced parties going to wrong areas and a whole series of, of mix-ups. But the ultimate uh, scheme was that the 101 went into Bastogne and the 82nd went on around to uh, Werbemont, and they fought under the 18th Airborne Corps, General Ridgeway, and we, the 101, fought under Troy Middleton's 8th Corps. In fact, the Germans knew of the movements of the airborne divisions through an intercepted radio message in clear. On day three, Monday the 18th of December, the Germans increased their effort to capture the chateau at Clairvaux, which was the only part remaining in American hands. Finally, when the thick walls were peppered by armor-piercing shells and the inside was burning, the surviving headquarters troops surrendered. Their final message, sent at 0528 hours on Monday, read, Position surrounded by armour and infantry. More armour and infantry moving north through town. This was the last message received from Clairvaux, and it was given 48 hours after General von Manteuffel's heaviest armoured spearhead had struck from Dasburg, less than five miles away to the east. 
In Hosingen, at first light on Monday the 18th, with no mortar ammunition left and rifle ammunition down to a few rounds per man, the company commander himself went out with a white flag. The determined defence of Hosingen, held for 48 hours against vastly superior numbers, seriously upset the German timetable. At Konstum, just before dawn, the German artillery directed a heavy barrage onto the town. As soon as it lifted, the 26 Volksgrenadiers, supported by tanks of the Panzer Lehr Division, attacked. General Height, as adjutant of Panzer Lehr Anti-Tank Regiment, you took part in this action. We heard then that the infantry, the 26 Panzer Grenadier Division, was not successful in taking the villages Honstum and Konstum uh, on the hill here. And for this reason, we got the order to support with our tank destroyers. So we supported with our direct tank fire and HD ammunition. And it was very slowly, maybe one or two hours for this two kilometers here. We had no food. Uh, we were running out of ammunition at Konstum. And uh, I went out uh, down the main road, partway between Constum and Postum, to find out what the tank situation was, and saw that it was most important to put as many daisy chains out on the main road between Constum and Holstum as they could. Well, the Germans had these terrific flashlights, or searchlights, that I guess mounted on trucks or on the tanks, that just showed up everything on the road of what we were doing. So one or two tanks, German tanks, were blown up running over these Davy terms. Others were hit by bazookas, and the others, the German uh, detective crews, got out and removed the daisy chains that we had laid. And uh, they, then in the, in the early morning of the 18th, we reported back to uh, General Cota, Defense Cutter, Wilkes, the situation. After midday, a fog rolled in from the east, forming a perfect screen for the German attackers. Anti-aircraft Bofors were left behind to fight a rearguard action, while the surviving defenders of Konstum and Holstum used the narrow twisting roads to link up with supporting artillery in the small town of Nocha, some four miles to the west. Early that Monday, the Panzer Lehr Reconnaissance Regiment, who had seized the Draufeld Bridge, had reached the Eschweiler Crossroads, where the 902nd Panzer Grenadiers turned right to race for Bastogne, and the Reconnaissance Regiment turned left to attack Wiltz. I was a sergeant with the 28th Division Military Police, and at that time the Germans were advancing from Clairvaux to Wiltz. I was ordered to set up a roadblock at this position here with three men. During that night, several stragglers from the 28th Division and other units infiltrated through here or retreated through here. Sometime in the evening, four men set up a position on that mound. At daybreak, Germans appeared in the distance. We opened fire, ran to our jeep, and got the hell out of here. To the south and southeast, Wiltz was dangerously exposed. The Germans attacked the town at 1100 hours on Monday the 18th of December with tanks and infantry. They drove the 44th combat engineers back with heavy casualties. At the same time, the German pressure eased as the Panzer Lehr reconnaissance was needed to assist in the capture of Bastogne and so pulled away from Wiltz. This left the job of capturing the town to the 26 Volksgrenadiers who had slogged up from the cliff on foot. Colonel Strickler, this must have been a desperate situation. How did General Cota react? We had organized a task force, Hoban, under Colonel Hoban, 
who uh, Colonel Hoban was the headquarters commandant of the division, and he gathered all the cooks and the bakers and the postmen and the, and uh, anybody he could get a hold of, clerks and people, uh, to uh, have a task force to defend headquarters of, at Wilkes. With Wilkes under attack, the threat to Bastogne became acute. To try and counter it, General Middleton, the Corps commander, gathered together working parties from various engineer units in the Corps area and used them to form a defence screen from Noville to Margaret to Mavi with a roadblock about three quarters of a mile south of Bastogne. With the arrival in Bastogne of Combat Command B of the 10th Armoured Division, General Middleton ordered its commander to split his command into three teams, sending one to Noville, one to Longville, and one to the village of Vaudin in order to block the approach from Wiltz. Colonel Roberts was not keen to have his command split in this way and his tanks used as static defence positions, but he also realised that this was no time to protest. In fact, the decision to block the threat from three directions instead of concentrating the tank reinforcements against the known attack coming from the northeast probably was one of the factors which was to save Bastogne. Although after three days of hard fighting under appalling conditions, 47 Panzer Corps had advanced only 12 miles from their start line, they had overrun most of the American positions east of Bastogne and were poised to thrust for the Meurs. However, by now the American reinforcements ordered into the area by Supreme Headquarters were beginning to arrive and the 5th Panzer Army was 36 hours behind schedule. Moreover, Wiltz was still in American hands. On the fourth day, Tuesday, December the 19th, Support for the 26 Volksgrenadiers arrived when the 5th Parachute Division of the 7th Army began to attack Wiltz from the south. When it became apparent that this attack was heavy, General Cota ordered 28th Divisional Headquarters to withdraw 14 miles west to Seabret leaving a provisional battalion of HQ staff to hold Wiltz for as long as possible. 200 survivors from the defence of Konstum were also ordered to help, and their commander, Lieutenant Colonel Strickler, took over the responsibility for Wiltz. We reorganised everything we could in the way of infantry and the units we had around Wiltz in order to hold it, hoping that he would send us reinforcements or that he would send us more ammunition would send his food, or that he would uh, direct us uh, to follow a withdrawal plan to get back closer towards uh, where his new headers quarters were going to be near Bastogne. And so all through that day we, uh, we were busy shifting and operating and our troops, uh, there was some hand-to-hand -hand fighting with the Germans and the Germans were were potting on our right, were potting on our left. They were uh, uh, yelling for us to surrender. We had about uh, seven, six or seven tanks left, which we placed immediately out on the main approaches towards the center of Wilson, our headquarters. The tank commander reported to me, he says, it's impossible for us to do much more. He says, our men are almost blind, they're, they're exhausted, we don't have much ammunition left, <coughs> and uh, we can't be of much help to you. I said, well, you just have to fight it out as long as you can. We can't give you any help, but we want you to help to defend Wilkes until we see what's going to happen here. At 1400 hours, a concerted attack was launched on the town by the 26 Volksgrenadiers from the northeast and the 5th Parachute from the south. Although the American artillery managed to knock out the tanks supporting the attack, by this time there was no question of sending reinforcements, as the Germans had blocked all roads into town. All that could be done was to blow the main bridge and save as many men as possible. 
Under the cover of darkness, a large number of American soldiers managed to make their way back to 28th Division headquarters at Seabret. With Wiltz captured, the roads to Bastogne were wide open to the German troops. The 28th Infantry Division centre had been smashed. They'd suffered heavy casualties and lost a large number of tanks, guns and vehicles. But they had also succeeded in delaying the enemy by at least 48 hours. Although this time was hard won, it was enough to allow the 101st Airborne Division to reach Bastogne and so make possible the defence of the town. General Ewell, you were commander of the 501st Parachute Infantry Regiment. What happened when you arrived at Bastogne? It's quite apparent something big was going on because the road was full of uh, big artillery pieces, engineer equipment, trucks of all types, all going in the wrong direction, but uh, didn't bother us too much. And uh, I arrived in the Bastogne area uh, well after dark after searching around a bit, found the Corps CP and met the acting division commander, General McAuliffe, and some of his staff there. It's quite interesting, the Corps staff was really beat. They were physically tired out and psychologically pretty shaky. However, the Corps commander, fortunately, was cool as ice and uh, in control and very reassuring to us. We looked at the uh, situation map. All there was left was the tactical CP. And the situation map looked like a measles chart, just red marks all over it with a few uh, friendly units east of Bastogne, some of which were obviously being encircled at the time. The American troops, with the added strength of their reinforcements, had formed a tight ring of defense around the vital road center of Bastogne. They were reassured by the knowledge that far-reaching plans were being made for a counterattack. The plans and timetables of the German high command had been seriously upset by the unexpectedly determined defense by certain small groups of American troops against overwhelming opposing forces. This defense brought the time needed for reinforcements to be placed in tactical positions in an attempt to stem the German advance. The Germans, contrary to their hopes and expectations, had been drawn into a major action that they'd hoped to avoid. This was to fester and become a major saw in their side. Nevertheless, although their timetable had been seriously disrupted and American reinforcements were known to have arrived, the German high command was still confident that the Meurs would be reached and crossed.